The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Lord to you. Jesus said to his disciples, Thus it is written that Christ would suffer and raise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of, of these things, and behold, I am send, sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, raised his hands and blessed them. As he blessed them, he parted from them and was taken up to heaven. They did him homage and they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and they, did, they were continually in the temple praising God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In our first reading today, St. Luke, writing in his Acts of the Apostles, to someone, a name that we often pronounce as Theophilus. But he, Luke is not writing to a single human being. He's writing to the entire church because the word is a Greek word, theophilus, which means beloved ones, beloved ones of God. He's writing to a group of people, but he's writing to the church. Now, we hear that oftentimes, certainly. I just thought I'd take a moment to help you to understand, not to think that simply that Luke is writing to a particular individual. He's speaking to all of us. And I've often have wondered how the apostles, you know, they had walked with Christ for nearly three years. Uh, they knew he had died on the cross. He had suffered, died, was taken down, placed in the tomb, was resurrected. He spent 40 days with them, speaking about the kingdom of God. He was laying the groundwork for his kingdom with them, teaching them. It wasn't a time for miracles, the miracles he did while he was on earth. But it was a time for teaching his apostles things that he did not yet have an opportunity to teach them. And he tells them to go back to the upper room, but they don't get it. He's trying to say goodbye. And all they want to do is hold on. They don't want to let go. They were so formed in the understanding of the law. And so deeply ingrained was the idea of the Messiah. The Messiah was going to come, he was expected, and when he came, he would be a political Messiah who would crush the Romans, he would put us all on a pedestal, we will rule with him, and we will step on everybody else. That was their understanding of the Messiah. They still did not yet give up that idea. The human being has a hard head. What can I tell you? How many people today hold on to false ideologies? False interpretations of the word of God. And if you try to explain it to them, they, they're ready to fist fight with you. Because ever since they were young and little, they've been taught the same thing. It's become ingrained in their brains. It's the same thing that happened to the apostles. It wasn't until the Feast of Pentecost when their hearts finally melted. And they finally opened up to the understanding, no, this is not it. It's not going to be a political kingdom at all. It's not going to be anything near it or anything like it. No one can certainly understand, you know, the Jewish people have been under Roman occupation for nearly 200 years. Nobody wants to be enslaved. And they certainly had a right to long for the freedom from that enslavery. And you could see why they would fall into that false idea that somehow the Messiah is going to take care of business. He's going to pound some heads. He's going to step on some toes along the way and we're going to rule and that's the end of the story. Never worked that way. Christ didn't come to establish a political kingdom. He came to establish a kingdom in, his, in the human heart of mankind. An interior, 
experience. Had Christ not ascended into heaven, we'd all have to go to Jerusalem. We'd all have to go to the Holy Land unless Christ came to us somehow, walked across the ocean and came to us to visit us. But we'd all have to make a pilgrimage to uh, Jerusalem at least once in our lifetime. Now, could God have stayed on earth for 2,000 years? Absolutely. Sure, he could have. He's God. But it's not what he intended. He came on earth to die, to suffer and to die. To redeem humanity from their sins. Not even a thousand blessed Virgin Mary or a million saints could accomplish what Christ did for humanity. Had he not ascended and returned back to his father, we would have no faith. We would need no faith. The theological virtue of faith would have no roots in our souls because all we have to do is turn on the television and maybe we get an image of Jerusalem and catch a glimpse of Christ. And our understanding of God would simply remain in this world. It would not be rooted deeply in a theological virtue of a faith that God gives to us in seed form of baptism and in confirmation. He gives us the fullness of that faith. Then it grows all the days of our lives. At least it's supposed to. It's supposed to. If you remember at the resurrection, Mary Magdalene is at the tomb. She's crying. The stone had been rolled back, which, by the way, represents also the hardness of the human heart. We have to roll away that hardness so we can find Christ in our ignorance and darkness and the falsehoods that we hang on to. But anyway, she's looking for Christ, and she realizes that Christ isn't there. So she cries. And through her tears, she sees a man walking towards her. She thinks it is the gardener. Of course it's the gardener. It's Christ who comes to cultivate the garden of our hearts, to plant his seeds, to transform the human being into a flower of love, the human being that is conformed to the image and likeness of Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit. But anyway, she doesn't recognize who it is. So she asks this gardener, if you have taken him, where have you put him? What does Jesus do? He calls her by name. And he says to her, Mary, Mary. As he calls each and every one of us by name. The church has never taught what the Hindus and Buddhists believe. And somehow we're absorbed into the Godhead and we lose our identity and we all become gods. Even some Christians who believe that as well. Church has never taught that. We will always have our identity for all eternity. Of course, if we make it to heaven, it will be a purified human being. But anyways, after he calls her by name twice, she recognizes who it is, and she is my little Raboni. Raboni, which translates to my little teacher. I can see a smile on her face and with love, an expression of great love. My humble teacher. My little teacher. And she wants to go and give him a hug. She's the one who poured the oil on his feet and dried it with her hair. She was used to having contact with Christ. Now all of a sudden Christ is saying to her, don't touch me. I have not yet gone to my father and your father. Was he being hard on her? Was he being selfish? Not at all. He was teaching her the most valuable lesson in Christianity and Catholicism that she would ever have and any of us would ever have. The mystery of the experience of the living God in the human soul. No longer this way or this way. 
We don't feel, like I said two weeks ago, we often like to approach God with our feelings. The human being has 11 human emotions called feelings or appetites, and that's how he lives his life. We have a broken nature. We live by those 11 human emotions. We don't go any further. In our brokenness, we don't raise ourselves up any high. If we don't get away from our emotions and allow the Holy Spirit to transform us, how are we going to grow in holiness? But he's teaching her a lesson, which hopefully is something we have learned over the years as well. We don't need to touch Christ in that way. Because people often say, well, you know, if I'd have been, and I've heard people say this to me, I don't know, maybe you've heard it as well. If I'd have been alive 2,000 years ago, I would have been a disciple of Christ. Really? Really. If you're not a disciple of the Eucharist, You would not have been a follower of Christ 2,000 years ago. Christ is among us. He is here. In Bethlehem, the house of bread. That's what the word translates to, the house of bread. He's placed in a feeding manger for animals. Because he feeds our lower nature. And he raises up into a higher nature. He comes here, body, blood, soul, and divinity, to give himself to us. Not this way, but in here. To enlighten our minds. So we don't simply live our minds by our emotions. We don't have to go to Jerusalem. We can experience the living God in the house of bread. We are the new Jerusalem. A word which translates into city of peace where the king of peace is found. The king of peace is here. He will be here momentarily on his altar as well. He comes to reveal himself to us, not through our external senses or simply our emotions, but in the depth of our souls, in the depths of our beings. Had he not gone back up to heaven, we would not have that experience. Christ is closer to us today then would he have stayed on earth because he comes into our beings. And there he reveals himself to us if we only give him the opportunity. The apostles in time certainly would learn the lesson as they would offer the holy sacrifice to the mass or receive the Eucharist, they would learn to understand. This was, this is Christ. They receive the same Eucharist, the same Christ that you and I receive, that Christian Catholics will receive around the world today. On every altar, there is the holy sacrifice of the Mass offered. Christ often spoke of taking on a new body. And this is something that sort of passes by us. But he spoke of it very clearly. It would not be a physical body like he took from Mary. It would not be a moral body like a social club, which derives its unity from the will of men. It would be a body that would be bound to him by the Holy Spirit, which he would send upon leaving this world. And he taught his apostles the nature of this new body. And these are some of his features. He told them that the member, in order to be a member of his new body, men would have to be born into it. But it would not be through a human birth, for that only made us sons of Adam. To be a member of his new body, one would have to be reborn through the spirit in the waters of baptism, which would make us adopted sons and daughters of God. The unity between his new body and him would not be through singing hymns to him, no having social teas in his name or gathering in parish halls or listening to broadcasts or the radio, but it would be absolutely in the sharing of his divine life and sharing life and sharing life and sharing in him. Dwell in me as I in you. The Gospel of John. His new body would be like all living things, small at first. Yeah. I remember when I had the opportunity to study in Jerusalem some years ago. One day we were out on a field trip, and our instructor told the bus driver to pull over, and we were in the middle of nowhere, and there was huge trees, and 
he went over to one of the trees and took off some of the pods. And he came over and had us all sort of line up. He says, now stick out your hand. We stuck out our hand. And he put little small mustard seeds in our hands. And it was just like the exact same thing you see as a pepper seed almost. It's that small. He said, you see this seed? This is what the, where these trees come from. And these were big trees. But that's what Christ was talking about. It would cut, start out small. It would start out with simplicity, complexity until the consummation of the world. The house expands from the outside in by the addition of brick to brick. Human organizations grow by addition of man to man. From the circumference to the center. His body, he said, will be formed from the inside out as a living embryo. It's formed in the human body. Because Christ is the center of the body, the mystical body of Christ on earth. As he received life from the Father, the faithful also would receive life from him. Our Lord said he would only have one body. It would be a spiritual monstrosity for him to have many bodies or a dozen heads. To keep it one, he would have one shepherd whom he appointed to feed his lambs and sheep. As the Gospel of John reminds us, there'll be one flock and one shepherd. We've been that way for 2,000 years. We're now in our 265th shepherd. He said that his new body would not manifest itself before men until the day of Pentecost, when he would send his truth-giving spirit Anything that would start there for even 24 hours after Pentecost, 24 hours before Pentecost, or simply 24 hours ago, would be an organization called together by a human spirit. It would not be drawn by the divine spirit. The Holy Spirit does not confuse the human being. He doesn't divide the human being into different belief systems. The Holy Spirit draws the human being into one. In the fullness and absolute truth. The most interesting observation he made about his body was that it would be hated by the world as he was. And as I've often said, if you lay out a map... And you look at the places and you stick a pin on the continents and places where the church is persecuted, you'll realize that 70-80% of the world hates and persecutes the Catholic Church. And we're persecuted in our own way here. We're, of course, here we're in the middle of the Baptist Bible Belt and you know, everybody has their own way of looking at us Catholics. You know, I remember a priest saying to me one time that Whenever the church is in the news for something and he goes to meet people, whatever, they always take two steps backwards. And I've even talked to some of our parishioners here who said that they've been made fun of, they've been attacked, their faith has been attacked, and so on and so on. And I always remind him, don't be angry. Pray for them that their hearts may be open to come to the fullness of truth. We brought some people into the church this year. Some of them were Baptists. They did their research work. They realized that what they had been taught was not the fullness of truth. It was only partial. What is divine, the world hates. What is worldly, the world loves. The nucleus of this new mystical body was his apostles. They were the raw material in which he would send his spirit to prolong and quicken himself. They would represent him when he was gone. The privilege of evangelizing the world was reserved to them. This new body of which were the embryo is now his prolonged personality throughout the ages.